Christopher Newsom and Channon Christian were a young couple from Knoxville, Tennessee. Christopher, born in 1983, was a former baseball player for the Halls High School Red Devils. He graduated in 2002 and attended the Pellissippi State Technical Community College, going on to become a carpenter. Channon, born in 1985 in Nacogdoches, Texas, moved from Louisiana to Tennessee with her family in 1997. She graduated from Farragut High School in 2003 and was a senior majoring in sociology at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Aged just 21 and 23, with their lives ahead of them, Channon and Christopher were victims of a brutal murder for which four males and one female were arrested, charged, and convicted. Those convicted were Latalvis Darnell Cobbins, Lamaricus Deval Davidson, George Giovanni Thomas, Eric Dwayne Boyd, and Vanessa Coleman. On 6th of January 2007, the couple had plans to go for dinner and then attend a friend's party. The couple had dinner at a local restaurant and were last seen leaving an apartment complex, presumably on their way to their friend's house. Investigators said that Shannon was behind the wheel of the vehicle and Christopher was stood in the open door of the vehicle, kissing her, when the two were attacked. The attackers forced Shannon and Christopher into the back seat of Shannon's SUV at gunpoint. Their hands were tied behind their back and they were taken to Davidson's house at 2316 Chipman Street. Here, an unthinkable attack ensued. Both Channon and Christopher were raped. Christopher is believed to have been raped inside the house. According to the Knox County Acting Medical Examiner's testimony, Christopher had been sodomized with an object and raped by at least one perpetrator. Following the assault, Christopher was taken to a set of railroad tracks where he was forced to walk barefoot. A mangled dog leash was found on a hillside leading up to the railroad tracks. It is believed this was used to force Christopher to walk. Christopher's hands were tied behind his back and his feet were bound together. He was blindfolded with a bandana and gagged with a sock, wearing only a shirt and underwear. Christopher was then shot in the neck and back, but did not die instantly. After a while, he was shot again in the back of the head. This last shot proved fatal, severing Christopher's brainstem. Following the murder of Christopher, his attackers set his body on fire. Whilst her boyfriend was being murdered, unbeknownst to her, Shannon was held prisoner inside the house. It is believed that Vanessa Coleman held Shannon captive whilst the males murdered Christopher. Following Christopher's murder, the assailants returned to Davidson's house to commit further atrocities. Shannon was subjected to horrific torture. She was repeatedly beaten and raped. It is believed that Shannon was tied to a chair and orally raped by Davidson and Cobbins. Shannon was also anally and vaginally raped, as well as being kicked in her vagina and beaten on the head. After several hours of torture, Shannon had sustained severe head injuries and severe injuries to her vagina, anus and mouth, suffering extensive hemorrhaging to her head and vaginal area. Her injuries were consistent with being raped with an object. Shannon's body also showed bruises and carpet burns. According to Davidson's confession, Shannon had said during her captivity that she didn't want to die. In an attempt to remove DNA evidence, Shannon's attackers extended her torture by pouring bleach down her throat. They also scrubbed her body, including her bleeding genital area, with bleach. 
Shannon was then hogtied with curtains and strips of bedding. Her face was covered tightly with a small bin bag, and then her body was put into five large bin bags. Shannon, who was only wearing her camisole and sweater, was tied in the fetal position, placed inside a residential waste disposal unit and covered with sheets. The medical examiner testified that there was evidence that Channon suffocated to death, dying between the afternoon of 7th January and the afternoon of 8th January. Disturbingly, apparently unfazed by the atrocities he had just committed, whilst Channon was left to suffocate, Davidson visited his girlfriend and gave her Channon's personal items. Davidson also used Christopher's phone and was seen wearing his shoes. When Channon and Christopher didn't turn up to the party, their friends began calling and texting them. They received no response and so at around 11 p.m., two of Christopher's friends went to the apartment where the couple had been kidnapped from. They found Christopher's truck but were unable to find Channon's SUV. Investigations revealed two witnesses. One was a driver for Waste Connections, who arrived on Chipman Street to work at around 12.30 a.m. on 7th January. He noticed the lights in Davidson's house were on and that the house seemed busy for that time of night. He also saw a forerunner in front of the house, which later drove slowly past him almost as if the occupants of the vehicle were checking him out. The witness saw four black men in the car. Another witness lived around one block away from 2316 Chipman Street, and they heard three pops from the direction of the train tracks at about 1.45 a.m. On 7th January, the couple's friends and families began searching for them, as Channon didn't answer calls from her mother and friend and didn't turn up to work. They checked local hospitals and filed missing person reports. Shannon's parents asked law enforcement for help, but were told they would need to search themselves for the first 24 hours. They sought help from Shannon's mobile phone provider and learned that her phone last pinged at a phone tower on Cherry Street, two blocks from Chipman Street. Cherry Street was supposedly a high crime neighborhood a news reporter covering the case said, it's not an area to go to unless you live there or unless you're up to no good. They searched the Cherry Street area where they found Channon's abandoned vehicle between 1.30 a.m. and 2 a.m. on 8th of January. They knew something was wrong. Several items were missing from the car, including a teddy bear, photographs, phone charger and iPod. The front seats had been pushed all the way back, where Channon would not have been able to reach the pedals. The floor of the car was covered in mud, which was unlike Channon, and stickers from the outside windows had been removed. A packet of Newport cigarettes was found inside the vehicle, even though neither Channon nor Christopher smoked them. Inside the vehicle was a critical piece of evidence, an envelope that yielded fingerprint evidence, which led them to one of the assailants, Lamaricus Davidson. Meanwhile, on 7th January at 12.20 p.m., Christopher's body was discovered by a Norfolk Southern Railroad employee. A comforter had been wrapped around his body and a sweatshirt wrapped around his head. His feet were bare and muddy. Semen was discovered inside of his body but the fire had destroyed any DNA. On 9th of January, police went to 2316 Chipman Street, but the house was unoccupied. They found Channon's body in a trash can in the kitchen. The bag she had been placed in had Davidson's fingerprints on them. His prints were also found on a box of garbage bags and his sperm was found in Channon's vagina and anus. Cobbins's sperm was found in Channon's mouth. 
Also inside the house were several items belonging to Channon and Christopher, including Channon's purse, clothes, shoes, camera, photographs, and iPod, and Christopher's baseball cap and driver's license. Several of these belongings had Davidson's prints on them. Davidson's sperm was found on Channon's jeans and Cobbins's sperm was found on her camisole, sweater and jeans. Shell casings were also found at the house that matched the bullets used to kill Christopher. With a huge amount of evidence against him, police began a manhunt for Davidson. Police learned of phone calls between Davidson and Boyd and Boyd directed them to a vacant house. On 11th of January, Davidson was arrested. In the vacant house, police found Christopher's shoes and a 22 caliber high standard revolver. During his interrogation, Davidson told five different stories. He first claimed that he left the house on Friday and knew nothing of the crimes. Then he told police that Cobbins and Thomas arrived at his house around 10 p.m. on Friday or Saturday and told him they had carjacked some people. Davidson claimed to have seen the victims tied up in the back seat and wanted no part of it, so left to go and smoke marijuana. He claimed he returned to the house 20 minutes later and found Channon. He used Channon's vehicle to deal drugs and wiped it clean. Davidson claimed he never raped Channon. On the 11th of January, Thomas, Cobbins and Coleman were arrested in Lebanon, Kentucky. In Cobbins's statement, he claimed he, Davidson and Boyd drove to an apartment complex to meet a girl and when they arrived they saw an SUV with a female in the driver's seat. Here, Davidson and Boyd carjacked them and ordered Cobbins to drive back to Chipman Street. Once at the house, Davidson took the woman into a bedroom and Boyd drove away with the man, later returning without the male victim. Cobbins denied having any sexual intercourse with the female, but admitted being present in the house during the crimes and claimed she was held hostage by the other defendants. The tragic double murder shook Knoxville and police were unsure of the motive behind the attack. The murders made people question why and how this had happened. There were questions around whether or not Christopher and Channon were victims of a hate crime, but prosecutors maintained there was no correlation between the murders and the victims' race. What do you think the motive behind the attack was? Let me know in the comments below. George Thomas faced a total of 46 charges. He was indicted on 16 counts of felony murder related to the rape, robbery and kidnapping committed against Christian and Newsom, two counts of premeditated murder, two counts of especially aggravated robbery, four counts of especially aggravated kidnapping, 20 counts of aggravated rape and two counts of theft. He was found guilty on multiple counts and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Cobbins faced the same 46 charges as Thomas. He was found guilty too of the murders of Channon Christian and Christopher Newsom. He was found guilty of facilitating the murder of Newsom, but was acquitted of Newsom's rape. He was sentenced to life without parole. Davidson faced the same 46 charges as Thomas. He was found unanimously guilty and the jurors found he should receive the death penalty. He was sentenced to 80 years, which were to be served consecutively to the death penalties. Coleman faced 40 Tennessee state charges. She was indicted on 12 counts of felony murder related to rape, robbery, kidnapping and theft, one count of premeditated murder of Christian only, one count of especially aggravated robbery of Newsom only, four counts of especially aggravated kidnapping, 20 counts of aggravated rape and two counts of theft. She was granted immunity for testimony in the federal case of the carjacking. She was acquitted of first degree murder and found guilty on lesser charges. 
she was sentenced to 53 years in prison. Boyd was indicted with being an accessory to a carjacking, resulting in serious bodily injury to another person, and misprison of a felony. Boyd was sentenced to the maximum of 18 years in federal prison. Boyd was later accused by Thomas and Cobbins of the rape and murder of Newsom, and a search warrant was obtained for his DNA. He was tried on state charges more than a decade later, in 2019, where he was sentenced to life imprisonment. In 2011, the judge who oversaw the initial trials was removed from the bench due to his dependency on prescription drugs. The new judge tried to overturn the convictions of all five assailants, and prosecutors appealed the decision. Only Thomas and Coleman received retrials. They were both found guilty again, and only Coleman received lesser charges. Her sentence was reduced from 53 years to 35. Thomas's punishment was actually increased, and he received two life sentences. What do you think of the sentences? Let me know in the comments below. The Channon Gale Christian Foundation and the Channon Gale Christian Memorial Golf Tournament were established in Channon's memory. They provide a scholarship for a Farragut High School senior to attend the University of Tennessee. A foundation was also established in Newsom's name, which holds an annual memorial baseball tournament. A memorial scholarship is given annually in Christopher's name to a graduating Halls High School baseball player. Additionally, as a result of the case, two new laws were introduced in 2014. The Chris Newsom Act was introduced, which eliminates the need for a judge's signature on a jury verdict after the delivery of a unanimous verdict. The Channon Christian Act restricts attorneys and defendants of attempting to portray a victim in a negative light, such as making allegations about their behavior. During the trial, Davidson alleged that his victims had come to his house to buy drugs. Channon's family felt immense pain as a result of listening to defense attorneys question Christian's character during multiple trials. Meanwhile, due to laws protecting the accused, the jury was not allowed to be informed of Davidson's previous carjacking conviction. What is the decision of the jury as to what the punishment should be with regard to those counts? The punishment is death. Uh, 